All right, welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. I'm David Bernholt from Oak Ridge National Laboratory, hosting today's webinar by Helen Kershaw from the NSF National Center for Atmospheric Research. We'll be speaking on code review for scientific software, experiences building an online tutorial. We want this uh, webinar, as the says on the screen, to be very uh, interactive. We appreciate your questions, but there we're expecting a lot of people. We already have a good number of people. So we'd ask you to um, write your questions down in the Q&A document. That's a Google Doc. I'll put the link in the chat again as well. Um, and we'll break for questions at various points throughout the webinar. Um, towards the end, we may have a chance to have a more interactive discussion. But for the time being, please keep your microphones muted so that uh, everybody has a chance to hear Helen without interruption. Also, it's really useful for us to get your feedback about the webinars uh, that you have attended. And so there's a link there, which I'll also put in the chat in a, in a bit, uh, where you can give us uh, provide a, answers to a short survey to give us a little help understanding what this webinar might have meant to you. Uh, the archives of this webinar, along with all the others in this series, will be published. There's uh, some text there on how you can navigate to this on the ideasproductivity.org website. This is the 82nd webinar in the series. Everything has slides and recordings, so if you want to go back and uh, review some of the old stuff, you're certainly welcome to do that. A lot of it's still quite fresh. and. Um, with that, I think we're going to get started with uh, Helen. All right. Um, let's see if I can share my screen. No problem. All right, cool. Uh, I think I'm up and running, so I'll get yep. started. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Helen. Um, I'm the lead software engineer with the DARES group at NSF NCAR. Um, and I'm going to be talking about code review for scientific software and chat about my experiences building an online tutorial. Um, since I started with three acronyms, I'll just define some more. Um, BSSWF, that's the Better Scientific Software Fellowship. NSF NCAR, National Science Foundation, National Center for Atmospheric Research. UCAR is like the governing body for NCAR. SEA is our software engineering assembly at UCAR and NCAR. DART is the data assimilation research testbed. So that's the software I work on. DARES is the group I work in. And I think I mentioned AMS at 1.2. So there'll be uh, points at the end for anyone who uh, collects any acronyms or initialisms that I've missed. Um, so here's my goals for the talk. Um, tell you about my BSSSWF project, uh, share my experiences about building the tutorial, and just share practice and experience um, from the NCAR Software Engineering Assembly. Um, and what they thought about code review and how they do it. Um, but really, my my overall goal is to get you thinking about code review and how you work with other people um, and the joy and pain sometimes of open source software. Um, so a small intro about myself. Uh, this is where I try and justify uh, why it's worth listening to me or at least give you some topics to break the ice if you want to chat to me after the webinar about software, supercomputing, geophysics. Uh, that's my email. Do reach out. Um, I have a geophysical sciences degree from Leeds in the UK, uh, so mostly solid earth geophysics. Uh, my dissertation was all about the earth's magnetic field and the core. Um, my fun fact about this is John Mound, who marked my dissertation, was scientific advisor on the, the B movie, The Core. Um, and since we're talking about reviews, I, I can't believe that only has a 5.5 star. Um, so after I graduated, I worked for an airborne geophysical survey company. Uh, so we flew gravity and magnetic surveys, small aircraft. Um, and these pictures are from a survey I did in Peru. <clears throat> and for magnetic surveys, you fly around with a magnetometer and uh, you have a ground station. And the rainforest you know, looks like that. It's pretty flat. Um, and you want your ground station to be as high as you can. Uh, so the ground station got put on an ant hill. Um, so physical debugging. Uh, and I remember thinking, this is not where I would put the ground station next time. So real life debugging and review, you know, why are we doing this? Could it be better? Um, I went to graduate school in New Zealand. Um, so I worked on breast cancer detection. Um, 
uh, using digital image-based elastotomography. So cancer's very, very stiff um, and you can detect it like if you put a, a surface motion through something, a word through something. So helioseismology really, but on people, that's how I used to describe it. Um, cool inverse problems. And I, I used to run on, on Blue Fern, which is um, a Canterbury supercomputer. Um, and that, that supercomputer was in a, in a building designed so well, um, it kept running during a 7.2 magnitude earthquake. Um, so what you design for, um, what it needs to do depends on where you are, you know, what's local to you, geography, people, team, what's important. Um, so I worked at NCAR for a little bit on DART, um, and then just took a break from NCAR and left to work at Brown University. Um, so I led a team of RSEs, research software engineers. Um, so we contracted ourselves out to work on various computational projects, uh, including physically informed neural networks, fish behavior, krill DNA, um, as well as like more traditional HPC topics. So like mechanical engineering, earth system modeling. Um, and I ran office hours for people to come and chat computation. So any topic, any language, any problem, whoever walked through the door. So we'd get about 200 visitors per year. Um, you know, anything too big, not fast enough, uh, buggy, we fixed. And in some ways, it might be the most impactful thing I've done. So a big shout out to all the facilitators out there on university campuses, you know, making, making things work. Um, my job now is I work on DART, which is a data assimilation research testbed. Uh, so we're open source. We've got a li large, I mean, a caveat large for scientific software. You know, we do data assimilation and, you know, really lively, no caveat on lively uh, community of researchers. So we recently, last year, had a full day session at AMS. Um, devoted to DART and, you know, the last 20 years of data assimilation. Here's the super condensed uh, rundown of DART, um, leading edge data assimilation research, collaborators throughout NCAR and the world. Computationally, it's, it's super interesting, but we have to go fast. Uh, one example here is, you know, using DART to predict where severe weather's going to go and flying airplanes at severe weather. So it's critically important, like your assimilation finishes before your next flight. Um, but yeah, super important to NCAR, predictability, you know, it's it's a big part of NCAR's mission. Um, so it's my last dramatic promo side, like forecasting is, is super important. So anyway, that's enough about me. Um, why am I here right now? Uh, Better Scientific Software um, is a, an organization, you probably all know. So it's a central hub for sharing information, practices and techniques, experiences, tools to improve computational science and engineering, software productivity, quality and sustainability. So it's quite wordy, but essentially software, you know, it's, it's the most important thing you can be doing. It says so on the front page. Um, and uh, I have, you know, they have a fellowship program um, which funds leaders and advocates of high quality software. So that's me for 2023 with my cohorts. Um, and I have a fellowship. Um, what's the problem I'm trying to solve? Um, if you'll indulge me, uh, like a 20 year old British comedy reference. Um, it's a quote from, Horror writer Garth Marenghi, I'm one of the few people you'll meet who's written more books than they've read, which is you know a hilarious joke for writers, but kind of a sobering reality for scientific software. So it's not that unusual for people working in science to write more code than they read, uh, but we, we can change that, right? <clears throat> so spoiler, um, here's the website. Uh, if you don't listen to the rest of the talk, uh, check out the website. Uh, let me know what you think. But yeah, so what am I trying to achieve um, with this tutorial? Like what outcomes would I like to see? Um, so people reviewing early and often, maybe some people in the audience have experienced this and it's not uncommon for people to be working on something for multiple years on their own. Uh, it then becomes more and more difficult to bring this work in from the cold and out to the community. Um, people reviewing each other's code uh, currently, we have a lot of collaborators and Dart's this central hub, which is great, right? um, but it leaves the burden of reviewing on the Dart team. So it would be good to scale this out. Um, you know, an ideal outcome would be like CI state assimilation people from Washington, you know, reviewing new ice observation code from, I don't know, New Zealand. Um, and getting people comfortable with napkin explanations of code. What do I mean by this? Um, so people will explain a scientific idea with a sketch on a whiteboard or, you know, on a napkin at a restaurant. Um, but when it comes to code, there's a real tendency to keep it hidden. So you might have heard people say, oh, I need to polish this before I show it to you. And there's some like psychological effect here. 
Um, so it'd be great to, to try and change this and getting people showing even pseudo code to each other. <clears throat> and then a, a big goal for me was to become a better reviewer. Reviewing's hard. Um, you really have to take into account how to communicate constructive and actionable criticism. Sometimes you don't do this as well as you should. I mean, I know I don't, um, but there's a real benefit, I think, to being on both sides of the review. So we're trying to humanize, humanize the process and, and build rapport between people. And better code, like no doubt peer review is a good tool for code. Is it the only tool for good code? No, no, but it's a good tool. And then just take a look inside. So this is a lofty goal, but there's a lot of people out there who would make really good software engineers and they don't know it yet. Um, so just normalizing people having a poke around GitHub at the software they're using. How does this work? Why did they do this? You know, could they have done it better? I mean, remember the ant tool, right? Like, you know, can I change this to make it better next time? Um, and, and more open source contributors. Um, some of you here will have noticed my ulterior motive. Um, I would like more contributors to, to Dart. Um, so that's where it started, the idea for this fellowship. Um, you know, I think Dart's super cool. Everyone should work on it, but I'm aware other people work on other codes. Um, so I wanted to build something that would help us, but not be specific to Dart. It's a massive win for us if we can onboard new people more easily. Um, but there's nothing specific about these skills and techniques to Dart. You know, there's a real wider community value. <clears throat> so code review is a skill, right? Um, you can break it down, you can practice, and you can get better at it. In the same way, language is a skill, social skills are skills. Everyone has different aptitudes, uh, but you can always improve your skill. Um, so the difficult thing, right, with a skill is, is you're learning you know, a bunch of other things at the same time. So it might be the mechanics of Git and GitHub. That can be tricky. Might be a new programming language. Um, you know, maybe you're a scientist learning a new programming language. Or maybe you're a software engineer learning a bunch of new science. Um, you have to fit into a team and all the culture that comes with that. <clears throat> and it never stops, right? Like whether you're just starting out or whether you're a seasoned professional, you're always learning something. Oh, and we want you to learn how to review code. Um, so I guess um, I guess I'll go over the the, the key tutorial now, which is at code code dash review .org. Um, and it's it's three sets of exercises. Um, so you may notice there's a there's a no code exercise in the code review tutorial. So ideally, um, this tutorial will get you started reviewing without requiring you to know any programming languages. Um, the no code or text exercises make no assumptions about about code and knowledge. <clears throat> so like the first exercise is a recipe, so bake and kick. Um, the second exercise is um, an example of like a culturally specific mix up. Um, so these can occur a lot when you're writing documentation for a global audience. Um, there's always a variation in cultural knowledge and it's, it's good to think about, you know, when you're writing or reviewing. And then the third exercise is some origami instructions with some problems. Um, so that's hands-on, hands-on reviewing. Um, so the exercises that you use code are in Python and Fortran. Um, you can do either or both. Um, Python is used by so many people across various disciplines, um, scientific, non-scientific backgrounds. Um, so it's a really wide reach. Um, so the Python exercises are kind of aimed at like the intro to Python level. Um, the Fortran tends to be a bit more restricted in its user base, um, typically numerical code. So there's some maths knowledge assumed in the Fortran and one of the Fortran exercises is, is like some refactoring, which typically you'll probably be doing if you're working with some large um, oldish Fortran code. And why Fortran, right? Um, that's a fair question. So we've got a lot of earth science, climate and weather code in Fortran, um, and it would just be good to get people curious about it, like just willing and capable of taking a look. Um, so the exercises are in no particular order. You can do whichever you want or some, all of them, whichever seems interesting or applicable. Um, each exercise is a issue, describing a problem and some prompts, um, and a pull request being a proposed solution. So it's a bunch of prompts to think about. Um, and then your mission during the tutorial is to review the proposed solution. Um, 
probably pause there for any questions that have that have come up before we get into the the mechanics of setting up the tutorial we have one that's being typed <laughs> as you speak oh yeah i, I like this question as it's coming uh, up. <laughs> Have you thought about using a code review process for AI generated code? I love that question because I think with AI, I feel like all code is going to be, well, a lot of code is going to be reviewing rather than creating. Like I think AI, especially like some of the co-pilot stuff um, from GitHub, uh, people are going to be much more early in the career looking at, oh, is this code doing what it should? Hopefully anyway. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think we can go on for now. Um, Feel free to add questions and we'll get back to them. Cool. <clears throat> um, so you know, let's take a look at, at setting it up. So it's it's on GitHub. Um, I realize there's other platforms out there. Um, GitHub does get us to a lot of people. Um, so that that's where it is. Um, So, um, so as, as I was working through setting up the tutorial, like oh, part of it's getting familiar with, with GitHub. That's some of the point of the tutorial, but you know, even just setting up a GitHub account, you know, it's quite hard making branches, enabling workflows. It's quite a high bar to entry already. Um, you know, and the whole point is, is to get people into code review, um, so with that in mind, um, I also did a version which is like a take a look repository. So all the pull requests and the issues are all there. It's all set up. So you can follow along and you can read it. Like maybe you're not clicking and doing the reviews, but um, you can have you can have a look at it. <clears throat> um, but for those that do want to go through the exercises um, and set up uh, the exercises so they can play with them themselves, um, it's done for you workflows. Um, so you put the tutorial, enable workflows, and run the workflow, choose you know, whether you want to do the text ones, the Python, or the Fortran, or all of them. Um, workflow takes uh, 20, 30 seconds. And if you set them all up, so this is the, the take a look one as an example, uh, you get a bunch of exercises, so issues and pull requests to play with. Um, so the tutorial um, is going to take you through navigating the exercises, so like navigating how you would in a, I know, whichever scientific Git repo you're looking at. So there's issues and pull requests. So problems and proposed solutions. So I just like prompt people to, you know, take a look at the issue and, you know, maybe like real life, the issues are a complaint from a user, a bug report, a request for a new feature. Um, and then there's a linked pull request. Um, you know, maybe a pull request is from a colleague, or if the call is publicly available, it could be just from someone who uses the code. Um, then the tutorial is going to take you through navigating between the two um, and having a look at the pull request. Um, so, you know, we we'll start with reading the description, and ideally, you want to get the size and scope of a pull request, what changes were made, and why. Um, in terms of what's changed, like small code changes can have big impacts. So like we do point out lines of code changed, but it's not necessarily correlate with how difficult or important or necessary a change is or how, you know, how it's going to, much time it's going to take to review. Um, but you can use GitHub to, to take a look at that. What's added, what's removed, what's changed, how many commits. Um, and then some prompts, you know, to think about um, as you review, like as you suggest, add suggestions, what the person with the pull request is looking for from the review. You know, they might have code ready to release. They might have an urgent bug fix. Um, they might have a draft they want you to look at before they do any more work. Um, and so I just talk about like adding single comments versus adding suggestions versus adding your whole review and just the mechanics of communication. <clears throat> um, you know, I'm sure many people are familiar with this, but if you click start a review versus add a single comment, you know, it's just going to save all your comments till you finish the review. And the differences on the other end is how many notifications the pull request author is going to get. Um, and, you know, whether you do that, you'll choose like lots of quick interaction or wait and deliver a review with a bunch of comments. 
is going to depend on who you, you collaborate with. Some people like the instant feedback. Some people don't. They don't want you know a million notifications. So it's a good idea to ask. Um, and sometimes you have to find this out working with people what works best. Um, so reviewing, which is the actual skill we're trying to develop, you know, just by using all these GitHub mechanics, and really thinking about both sides of a review. And the two sides I'm talking about here is reviewing and being reviewed. Um, and I really wanted to stress both sides uh, because it reminded me of the first experience I had interviewing someone. Um, so same scenario, right? Um, you're just the interviewer rather than the candidate. Um, and it really opens, opens your eyes. Um, so now when I can, it's something I try to expose people to as early as possible in the career. So we've had an undergrad student working with us and she's been on the interview committee for summer students. So it's a positive and interesting experience just to see the other side, especially seeing the other side with not, not that much pressure. Um, so it's really good practice just to try and see something from someone else's point of view. So when reviewing, here's a bunch of the prompts, but I'll, oh, the yellow is kind of the crux. Um, you know, does the pull request address the issue, right? What problem are we trying to solve? <laughs> we wanna always be solving the right problem. Um, and just different ways to think about, you know, are there deal breakers that would, you know, it's, it's a no, we can't accept this. Can you suggest improvements? Are there ways to phrase your improvements um, that would be better? Are things overly complicated? Um, the comments helpful? Um, for There's a really good example of an overly complicated solution, which I'll link to on the website, is um, FizzBuzz, but written in TensorFlow. Um, so, you know, you can, you can think of some interesting kind of bad examples, but yeah, um, are the comments all up to date? Are they necessary? Are they helpful? You know, would you accept it as it is now? Um, how you communicate, you know, the changes you want, are they nitpicks? Are they definites? Um, and then just kind of, um, especially for people who've already working with their own code, um, you know, do you spend a lot of time reviewing other things that you review a lot that you could probably automate? Um, or at least, you know, give out style guides um, and help things like that. Um, and a big takeaway from thinking about reviewing is, is how to give your code. Um, um, it's how to, you know, make it life easier when you, you submit your own pull requests to make it easier for a review, reviewer to understand what makes something good, what makes something bad when you're reviewing. And you think about that while being reviewed. Um, you know, and lots of people like to use tools to enforce things. Some people hate them. You know, what, what works for you? What would bog you down? What would speed you up? And some of you are going to read these prompts and think, ah, that one's not important at all. This one's super important. She's totally missed what's important to us. So my goal isn't to prescribe, like, this is the way to do review. It's going to vary from team to team. Um, so the goal is just to provide prompts um, people to like adapt to their own workflow. Um, so that's kind of the, the tutorial. Um, probably gonna go talk about the mechanics next. So how it's set up and how you had exercises. But I think it's probably a good time to pause for any questions on you know, the reviewing bit of the tutorial. Yeah, so there is a question which says it's fairly long. How do you archive the reviews for the long term? I.e., the code can be moved transparently using Git, but how would you access review comments, etc.? If Microsoft shuts down GitHub in the future, um, a parenthetical note: I ran into this issue when Atlassian Bitbucket suddenly sunset Mercurial support. Oh no! So someone just asked me that yesterday in our group. Um, so I think my paranoid answer is you can download all the information from github i believe but um yeah so right now i know we are and i know lots of teams are kind of relying on github as like a like a historical back and forth like discussing a problem so whether it's an issue or a github discussion and then the back and forth and in, in review um so i don't i don't have a, a really good answer i know some people host their own um their own uh, like GitHub, rather than using GitHub, you, you host your own. Um, but again, you're kind of subject to like your lab or your company's funding. Um, so that's a long answer for a short answer is, I don't have a good solution to that. Um, but if anyone does, 
um, or has experience of grabbing and archiving uh, various repos, let me know. Okay. Yeah, there's some more comments. Oops. Yeah, sorry, there's some more comments coming in on this. Um, so we can look back at that um, yeah. later on. There is another question, but it really has to do with the mechanics of the tutorial, which I think you might cover next. So let's defer that one. <clears throat> cool. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna go through how how this tutorial is set up, how you can add exercises. Um, so there's there's two workflows, um, two GitHub actions that run on demand. So one creates the exercises, and that's the one with like the choice, text, Fortran, and Python at the moment. And then one to reset the exercises. And the reset exercises, it closes the issues and it closes the pull requests, but it also resets the repository to the beginning, like I have a beginning tag. And the reason it's like quite a hard reset is because you might have like merged and reviewed reviewed and merged pull request, and maybe you want to do the exercises again. So you have to go backwards in time. Um, so there's two directories that actions are going to look at. One is issues, one is pull requests. Um, and hopefully the pseudocode makes sense. But um, so the action is going to look for a language, text, Python, Fortran at the moment, uh, and it's just going to see how many exercises there are. It's going to grab the issue, um, which is the text of the issue to create. It's going to label it with the language. Um, it's going to look for the pull body. So that's whatever text you want in the pull request um, and a corresponding branch, for that language and issue. Um, so the create the issue and it's going to create a pull request using the branch and the pull, pull body, which is the text of the pull request. Um, I've put the code in directories, language slash exercise. There's no actual requirement for that. Um, I just found it, it tidy. Um, resetting the exercises um, requires a backup branch. That's a bit of extra work to kind of set up um, the branch that you want and then create a backup so you can do the reset. Um, but I just found it really nice to be able to do that, that hard reset, um, especially because there's some because you have to run workflows through the tutorial, there's there's some setup um, that you don't really want to do every time, like destroying the repo. Um, and some of you who are looking at the tutorial, you might have noticed, noticed I've got a really squashed, a really condensed Git history on the main branch. So it's essentially the initial commit. And then here's the whole tutorial. Um, so part of the reason for that is some of the exercises talk about just looking at like look at the commits to to look at the history and see how people developed. So is it realistic to have this really tiny main branch commit history? No, um, but I think it's a simple start just to encourage people to look at individual commits without without being over first. Um, so that's the tutorial, like the the GitHub behind it. The website goes through all the exercises. Um, take a look. Um, Oh, you can go to the GitHub organization as well and really have a poke around in there. Um, so that's the mechanics. Um, I guess um, I can stop there and take some mechanics questions if you want Yeah. Um, we, before I switch gears. We do have one or two. I think the first one you answered, but I'll ask it anyway, just to make sure. Does running the tutorial result in the creation of a repository that will need to delete afterwards? Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what I was hoping to get at with the, the reset. So because like someone doing it, doing the hands-on, you know, they have to create the repo, they have to go in and enable workflows, which is like the high bar to entry, right? You wouldn't necessarily do that instantly on your own starting out code. Um, but yeah, once you've done that, you can do what you want. And if you want to go back to the beginning, you can use that hard reset. Um, but yeah, you, you kind of are left then with your, with your own copy of the tutorial. Uh -huh. um, and then yeah, the, another question is this all done in a fork um yeah you can it's I advise people to do it in a fork you can just like copy it and push it up to wherever if you want to change it or you know for whatever purposes you want but yeah i the tutorial the way the website's going to take you through is is to fork or if you don't want to be dealing with any of the git interactive stuff um yeah you can just read through 
um, the take a look one. And that's like no GitHub account, no fork, no nothing necessary. Mm -hmm. All right, that's it for now. Cool, <clears throat> man, I've been talking a long time. Um, so um, I'm just going to switch gears now um, and talk about some real life experiences with code review. Um, and I guess to kick it off, I just start with one of my favorite quotes about programming. So software engineering is programming integrated over time. And I think it's a good way to think about software. Like I'm sure there's many people here who work on very mature software products and you know, mature teams. Um, but in research software, there's a lot of people at sort of the inflection point where they have code um, and they want to move towards sort of robust, collaboratively developed software. And I, and I think that's a big part of what better scientific software is about. Um, and another way to look at this quote is what you've always done shapes what you're going to do unless you intentionally change it. So practice makes permanent, uh, good or bad. Um, so an, a good way to assess what you're doing and how you're working is, is to chat to other people. Um, and one of the groups I can draw on, um, which is great, is the Software Engineering Assembly at UCAR. Um, so, you know, what is the SER, Software Engineering Assembly? Um, so the mission um, is to foster a sense of community for software engineering professionals within UCAR. Um, facilitate effective participation of software engineers through cross-cutting interactions and new car science mission uh, to enhance communication with management um, in matters of concern to software engineers and to engage uh, new car software engineers as full partners in setting priorities for the design, development and maintenance of the software infrastructure needed to realize new car's mission. So that's that's SDA, that's, that's their mission, that's what they, they aim to do, so foster facilitate and advocate. Um, and I have to say a big thank you to SEA for, for making SEA happen. Um, it's a great organization. They actually have a conference coming up. Um, so the link's there if people are interested. And I believe the theme this year is all about uh, modernizing scientific software. <clears throat> anyway, so one thing uh, we do this year is have informal get-togethers um, to chat about practices and experiences. So they're like lightly moderated discussion, um, sent out some questions beforehand to get people thinking. Um, and I'm interested in code review, so I actually moderated a code review one. Um, uh, here's what we sent out. Um, like I say, uh, we try and stress that any discussion topics are welcome and any experience level. Um, you know, it's important to get, to get people of all uh, backgrounds. Um, and we want to, you know, encourage people to share good and bad experiences. Um, you know, it's good to learn from other people's pain or other people's scars, right? Um, you know, whether people use code review, whether they find it helpful, whether they don't, um, if they have like tips for reviewing or social hacks that made, made the review process easier. Um, and in-person versus offline, like how has that changed post-pandemic? What works, what doesn't? Or, you know, are you just spending too much time in review? Um, and you have ideas that that improve the process for your particular group. Um, so it was a super lively discussion. It was great. Um, I'm going to show some quotes just to capture the range of experiences that people have. Um, the quotes are from the meeting notes. Um, so like self-reported um, and also scribed. Um, I've left the quotes as they are. Try not to editorialize. Um, but the yellow highlights are mine just to, to bring out some key points that, that I noticed. Um, so code review feels like someone works with me and we learn from each other. So a nice positive experience. Uh, lots of talk about first time between junior and senior developers. Ideally, you know, learning both ways. Um, what people, when people don't know much about what's going on, what others are doing in the project, review gives that opportunity, that window to learn about what's going on. Um, lots of people were saying GitHub made it easier to do code review, <laughs> but with the downside that because it's so easy, there's a lot more back and forth, um, especially if like review is not top priority, so you can slow down the process. Um, you know, and coupled with that is people getting burnt out with code review. So you know, do a review, wait a couple of weeks. It can feel quite negative sometimes. Um, so definitely aware that that's a problem. Um, 
and then a good range here of like people who used to do code reviews in person, code reviews in person, um, found it super helpful, finding bugs, finding problems, um, can't imagine not doing it. And then the other end, so people brand new, um, experience mostly in being reviewed uh, rather than reviewing, um, just coordinate and finding the time, you know, is it helpful to have you know, senior work through, walk through the review first. Um, so really lots of touching on, on communicating about what to look at in the code, um, trying to re reduce the overhead. So back and forth, you know, expectations for when things should happen, what's going to happen, what's the timeline. So, you know, um, big theme is, is setting expectations um, and terminology and language means different things to different people. Uh, I was at a workshop recently with a mixture of like hardware people, data providers, observationalists, and domain scientists. And lots of people are using the term end-to-end, -end, but end-to-end -end is quite different depending on what your particular field is. Field is. So like something that sounds quite simple, same words, uh, means something completely different. Um, we had quite a lot of discussion um, afterwards as well um, on code review as being an exclusionary process, which at its heart, it is right like it's a barrier to code changes um but what what else are you stopping like what other barriers are you putting up um unintentionally or you know when you when you engage in code review um so there's some like recommended papers and talks um a lot of you know people talking about the friction around code review the ethics isn't clear you know the comparison is you know reviews of papers um you know, maybe there's there's um people have found there's more pushback for women's code. Um the talk there is all about race, ethnicity, gender, and age, and how those are all affected in, in code review. That's a, a communications of the ACM publication. Um, yeah, and just some really interesting th things to think about and like consequences of reviewing and how you do it. Um, I think what people were saying is is to pick the most impactful aspects of the code to comment on. Um, so whether that's functionality, quality, maintainability, readability, like what, again, so expectations, communications, and automating as much as possible, um, which I think goes back to, I know, death by a thousand cuts of nitpicking. Um, you know, what's what's that like as an experience um, and, and how to um, maybe use automation to, to ease that. <clears throat> um, so lots of things about like, you know, what is and isn't helpful, um, you know, sufficient description is less helpful. Sometimes reviews have a lot of back and forth. Things can get political. That's a recurring theme. Um, the thing being reviewed, it's like the thing, not the person. It's a joint responsibility. Encourage, you know, the code and not your code. I think if you can solve this problem, you've learned a lot about people. Like this, it's very easy to say it. It's, it's extremely hard to do. Um, but yeah, talking about like the asynchronous aspect, um, how to phrase questions and what was really interesting is because we have a lot of people who've been sort of scientists and developers and sort between them. Um, and so setting collective expectations as a team. So like, you know, it can be different person to person. It can be different, you know, depending on, on what you're delivering. Um, so NCAR and UCAR, we have quite a cross-section of like pure research versus uh, operational product, um, you know, and how do you deal with those all the same? You know, you know probably not. Um, this is my last one. Um, so it was interesting, like one-on-one -on -one code review in person versus remote. Um, and, you know, we have people who've never done an in-person code review because they've never been in person. Um, you know, and when getting someone new to the code, um, the upfront overhead of reaching out, um, people found that that benefited them reach out individually upfront, um, and clarify the process. Um, code review is an onboarding task. Um, that's actually my comment. Um, I like to get people reviewing code as soon as possible. So reviewing like my code or someone else's code and getting really comfortable asking questions. This is not a universal approach. <laughs> Uh, some people did not agree with that at all. Everyone's different. Um, and they much prefer something much more like pair programming. So like working side by side, working together. So rather than write review, being totally separate. 
uh, much more integrated. And then just to finish with the last of the quotes, um, this was talking about social hacks, how you deliver feedback effectively. Uh, Microsoft, uh, they have a guide to use emojis with their comments. Uh, so I'll leave it to the reader um, to decide which of those emojis means like, like it's nitpick, thinking out loud, take it or leave it, um, or the rest of them mean. So I really enjoyed the SEA discussion. Um, I learned a lot. I think shared a lot of really good experiences. Um, so thanks to the SEA. Um, and I guess that leads me to my kind of wrap up, uh, which is about finding community. So I can take, I know if it's a good time to take some SEA questions um, before I- Yeah, we had one that I think relates to one of the quotes that you um, put up. And the question is, would a walkthrough first sometimes prejudice the reviewer to the coder's viewpoint and thus miss some problems? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a really good point. And I think it's connected to, uh, I forget what the term is like, it's like hippo, like most highly paid person in the room um, can really influence a discussion. Um, so I think, uh, personal opinion, I think a walkthrough of how you're going to walk through the process and what they're looking for in a review um, is good. Um, I mean, ideally, you've got a bit more back and forth before the pull request stage, like there's some feedback in the design, I realize that's not always, you know, how the world works, especially in scientific code. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't know, it's connected to like, um, prejudice and review. And should you have like one walkthrough and someone else coming in totally fresh? Is that a good, you know, if you have enough people to do that? Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point. Right. We had a comment more than a question that um, was one of the best ways we found to preempt friction points before the review is to have clear uh, repository guidelines around PRs, not just around style, but also scope, e.g. only one feature per PR, things like that. Yeah, I think there's some really helpful practical tips. We actually had um, quite a lot of people uh, sharing um, so like pull request templates. So like things that you'd have to check off, check off, like, oh, I have done this, I have done this. Um, and I think, I think that is, that's super helpful. That would be a nice thing to collect awesome pure mm -hmm. uh, pull request templates. And then um, somebody asked and, and then noted that you answered pretty much, but I'll ask the question anyway. Do you think having some kind of design review before code reviews solves some of the friction with code reviews. So I think it does, and I love it because I feel like design is the most interesting bit, and coding is just typing. But I think, I think, I think you're always going to have the situation where someone's already done a bunch of work, and some people, some people like to write the code to think through their thoughts. Um, so I think it, it does help. Is it going to solve everything? No. And uh, let's see, we have one more. Uh, do you have some suggestions or tips for working with scientists or non-software engineers on the code review process? Um, so there's some good suggestions came from UCAR. Um, so I think uh, if you can, it's good to... Um, have a little bit of chat or a little bit of or building earlier. So I don't know if you're in the working together in the same group or the same project. Um, and uh, sort of spending a little time, um, sort of face to face, whether that's remote or not. And just I think chat. I find a good question to ask is like, oh, what like what are they looking for in review? Because that's what you want. You want collaborative, collaboratively to make better code, right? And so, you know, what what bits are you worried about in this code? What, um, and maybe they're not receptive. But I think most people, you can find something. Oh, you know, um, what are they worried about? And if you can help them with that, then you've kind of you've you've built a little bit of trust, right? You've you've helped them with the problem they've got. Um, and from there, um, I think you can make sort of headway into 
digging a bit deeper in you know what what you as a code maintainer or you as a, a reviewer want to get out of that that's a bit waffly but hopefully that that was that was helpful mm -hmm. all right we also had uh, someone suggesting a github blog article um that i've captured into the notes so folks can will be able to go back and see that as well about um, writing better commits, building better projects. And with that, I think you can uh, move on and wrap up. Cool. Um, yeah, so I guess um, implicit in code review as, as other people, um, sometimes it's future you, right? I'm sure you've all had that experience of looking at your old code and thinking, what was I thinking? Um, but most of the time you're part of a team, right? So other people's code, other people's ideas, competing priorities, varying communication style, different goals. Um, and, you know, building community and building great teams takes time, skill, and dedicated effort, right? But you don't have to start from scratch. Um, so if you're the only person writing code on your team, or like the only software engineer in a group of scientists, maybe, um, join an RSE organization and, and find your people. Um, so hopefully I've communicated sort of the, the joy of open source for science. Um, it's quite a privilege really to get to do it for a living. Um, and I do want to make it open and welcoming. Um, like I said, there's a lot of people out there who would make really good software engineers and they don't know research software engineering is a thing. Um, that's changing, I guess, over the last few years, which is great. I mean, thanks to organizations such as these, and this isn't an exhaustive list. Right, there's lots of people doing great stuff. Um, if you're a scientist and you want to get into more software engineering, or you're you know, a computer science student and you want to get involved in science, um, shameless plug, but come and talk to me. <clears throat> we have NCAR visitor programs. Um, we can pay for people, summer programs. And for those not already involved, uh, do check out USRC. Um, there's actually a code review working group. So Jeff Carver and Troy Comey are leading that. Um, so there's lots of you know, good stuff going on and working groups to join. So with that, um, I'll wrap up, uh, take any more questions or, you know, people's thoughts or comments or tips. That'd be great. Great, Helen. Thank you so much. Um, I think at this point we can have people um, raise their hand in using the, the um, Zoom tool and we can call on people to unmute and ask questions have any uh, while people are thinking about that I have a we have a comment in the chat from Pat it says great talk look forward to going through the tutorial it seems like it'll be a good thing to add to our onboarding of summer student of students this summer cool yep another great talk comment anyone want to um, ask Helen any more questions or comment on some of the things that she said Uh, Gregory. Hi, thanks for the talk, Helen. This is great. Um, I uh, um, I was curious. Uh, I wanted to kind of expand, get get a little bit more of your expansion on the idea of like um, preempting code review with a uh, design review, design sketch. Um, that's something I, I work, I, I'm fortunate enough to work with some of the folks on uh, at NCAR um, on the CTSM uh, like model. Um, and one of the things we've been trying to implement is using like design documents to help scope out like a larger piece of code. Um, but also thinking about like, how do we break up code to make review more tractable um because uh, it it does seem like there's the thing that i've been struggling with is how to uh um approach people's different styles to developing software like you said some people just like want to dive in and start sketching things out and figuring things out whereas i'm more like all right let me take a step back and write on my whiteboard what it's going to look like have you found a good uh or have you 
do you have any thoughts on like exploring that space on how to get people to kind of coalesce that those different methodologies, those different modes of working into like a design document that then everybody's kind of like, this is what we agreed to review to or like verify things against. Yeah, I think that's some interesting points. And I think what you're touching on is like, there's like requirement stocks, which you can kind of get people to agree to. But, you know, things do change over time. Um, something we tend to use is um, like a spec doc. Um, so a specification, like functional and technical, right? Because I think kind of agree on what it should do and how you how you do it can be two different things um i've forgotten the guy's name it's like coding horror guy i think has a really nice blog article on functional versus technical um and this is something that i think is good practice for people to do as well it's good to make something someone else's problem as quickly as possible and one way of thinking about that is so i work with quite a few students right and so you really when you're working with say a student are you working with oh I want to put this out and see if anyone's in the community is interested in doing it is then you have to be really defined about like oh I'm not going to do it but here's here's the design really or here's the the idea and the requirements and a couple of suggestions for design or like a couple of things like oh um you know we need to assess whether this is going to work and this is the quickest way we're going to do it so that's a long answer but I think what we're trying to use and we don't always get it right is um yeah specking something out um and getting getting at least some input and some i mean because i mean like ctsm like the project's quite big right so not only are you specking out a single problem you've you know however many sort of things going on in parallel that maybe all have to come together at some point too does that help it's kind of <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, it's not something we're going to like solve right away. I was just uh, uh, curious uh, to get more, more of your insights on it. The, and the, I really like the make something something someone else's problems sooner. I think I, I like that phrase. <laughs> Thanks, Gregory. Any other questions or comments for Helen? Well, one thing I struggle with is um, getting developers to, there's some don't like, they like to finish everything. I think you made some good points. They like to finish everything before they show it to you. And how do we get them to understand that we're, we don't want to criticize their code, but, you know, how do we shorten that time period? I don't know what the real problem is, but I suspect it's trying to get it perfect before they push or something. Yeah, I, I, it, I wish, in some ways, I wish I could really get my head around it because I do, like, you do see scientists or just like, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know whether it's just the language of explaining code and ideas. It's just not there. Um, but yeah, I think, I, know, I feel like there's some scope for sort of sociological psychological research there but, oh, I, I even know. find it among computer scientists stuff <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's I like guess uh, encouraging people... the guides that you're talking about to make like I think it was Philip or someone on here who said make sure it's one feature per... oh it was Conrad one of the best ways we found to preempt friction <laughs> is only one feature per PR I think it has to benefit people too. And I think that just does take time, right? Like review you has to be a benefit for someone. You know, I think overall it's a benefit to review early, but if it doesn't feel like that when you're working, then you're probably not going to do it, right? So I, I don't know if you can have like small wins soon or, you know, as a team. So we're getting a number of comments in the chat or comments slash questions. I'm going to just kind of try to run through them um, so that we can, we have five minutes left in the session. So 
Uh, Gregory says, uh, I'm also wondering how much we can learn from other engineering domains that often have to build large complex things together. Yeah, I think so. I feel like we call it software engineering, but it's not as strict engineering as like building airplanes or bridges, right? Um, we're quite young as a discipline. Mm -hmm. And how do agile practices interface with your experiences and recommendations for code review? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, it, I think more interaction more often, right? Like, I guess a big thing in agile is people have a process. And so I hope I've tried to get that across with the tutorial, right? Like, I don't want to give people, here's exactly what you should do when you're developing code and reviewing. And these are the exact steps, I think. Um, yeah, like whatever group you're working in, I think you have to reflect on, I don't know, what was good, what was bad, what should we change? I guess measuring what was good and bad is difficult, but, um, yeah, I think, I guess being agile about your development process as well as, you know, just the, the agile development. Well, but another aspect of, um, of agile and the scrum process in particular is the retrospectives where yeah. you do actually um, consider what went well, what went poorly, what would you change, things like that. So there's probably avenues for that as well. Uh, we have a comment from Scott who says, one point here is that getting one's, sorry, I can't, cursors in the way, one's code in early will enable others to use it sooner, thus better testing, more exposure, et cetera. Yeah, totally uh, agree with that. As a potential motivator for getting people to commit sooner rather than later. Of course, I, I can see that as being um, exactly a negative too, right? Mm -hmm. The the exposure, <laughs> that's what they're trying to avoid <laughs> in many cases. <laughs> um, question from Dimitri, what do you think about changing the history in the repo? Oh, that's a good question. So like the Dart, we don't do it because we have so many people not so many people, but we have, a, you know, people developing um, and it's totally open. So I'm paranoid, um, but I do like it when I look at other people's code and they've cleaned up the history. Um, it tells a very nice story, um, but I think, oh, you have to be very careful. And uh, does code review include reviewing code documentation as well? Oh, it does for us. Um, so obviously, uh, varies team to team, but yes. So we, one of our pull request requirements is that you have some documentation. Um, but yeah, we actually uh, we have a mountain of documentation that we're actually looking to prune. So that's another conversation that I'd be great to hear people's ideas on. Um, but yeah, I think the thought of how people interact with your documentation and you know, whether it's developers or users or, I don't know, people just curious uh, and how they go through it. I think personally, that's the, the next big thing on our list of, of improving our documentation. So yes, we do review it. Are we good enough good enough at it yet that I would <laughs> that I would push our documentation as an example? Not quite, but um, yeah, we're definitely thinking about that. Well, maybe that's another seminar topic for you or somebody else in the future. Um, with that, I think we should wrap it up. Uh, I really appreciate, Helen, your talk and the uh, interaction that everybody here has provided. As I mentioned, we will get the um, archives out. We'll have the recording and the slides, and Helen will um, write down some of the answers to the questions that have arisen so that we have those captured as well. And everybody who's registered for the meeting will uh, webinar will get an email when that's ready. Our um, next webinar will be on May 15th, and you'll be getting an, e uh, an email about that shortly when I have time to put it together. And, um, and last but not least, once again, I would ask you to please consider um, giving us some feedback on this webinar, and I will momentarily put the link again in the chat. I lost it before. There we go. And with that, I thank you all very much. We look forward to seeing you at the next webinar and in between at other events. 
Thanks very much. Sabrum.